after some areas of fog in the morning. Highs from 72 to 77 degrees. That's it for the news tonight on this Thursday, November 1st. Thanks for joining us. Thanks to those of you who called in a pledge. We were able to meet our financial goal tonight. Thanks to KPFA's apprentices who produced the recorded portions of this broadcast. Kelly Ramirez is at the controls with Max Pringle. I'm Mark Miracle. Good evening. This is KPFA or KPFB in Berkeley or KFCF in Fresno. I'd like to tell you that our pledge drive is continuing through Friday at noon. So if you can come down tonight or tomorrow and help us answer phones, it would really be great. Time now is 7 p.m. And coming up in our next hour is a very special program hosted by C.S. Sung. Stay tuned. C.S. Song, you're listening to special KPFA Fun Drive programming. You watch it and wonder how this film could possibly have been made. You see sweatshop workers in China speaking candidly about their labor, their day-to-day existence, and their dreams and ambitions. China Blue is an eye-opening, shocking documentary film about two teenagers who just might have made the jeans that you are wearing. I spoke not too long ago with the filmmaker of this film, China Blue, and I'd like you to present to you that conversation right now. When it comes to a topic as sprawling as globalization, abstractions and generalities abound. You've heard the messages. Globalization sucks. Workers in the global south toil endlessly. Multinational corporations exploit non-unionized factory labor abroad. Western consumers benefit from the suffering of low-wage workers thousands of miles away. Well, if it's important to move beyond these generalizations, how exactly do we do that? Who can bring us up close and personal with the actual workers who, for example, make our clothes in foreign sweatshops? Which government would be crazy enough to allow filmmakers to film an expose? And which factory would be crazy enough to grant access, access that might result in the dissemination of shocking information about what's being done in the name of higher profits? These and many questions have in a way been answered by an award-winning film called China Blue. Somehow, improbably, China Blue's filmmakers were able to penetrate the walls and dormitories of a blue jeans factory in China. There they filmed young female workers working, resting, playing, pining, dreaming, complaining, that is, being humid and human and candid and honest. There's much more to the film, but since we are now joined by its director and producer, Mika Pellet, I'd rather you hear it from him. Mika Pellet has been making videos and films since the 1980s. He is a former executive director of the group Media Alliance, and he is well known for his PBS documentary, Store Wars, When Walmart Comes to Town. Mika joins us now by phone. Welcome to you. Hi, CS. That was a great introduction. Well, thank you. It's a great film. How did you first get the idea, Mika, of making this particular film? Well, the idea came actually from my previous film that you just mentioned about Walmart. Uh, I conceive of my projects as being not just a film, but also a website, uh, because there's always a lot of data to provide. And you also, uh, I try to leave people with uh, the question, well, what can we do about it after they've seen the film? And so the websites uh, answered that question by offering links and so forth. So when we created the website for the Walmart film, I got interested in the question of where Walmart gets all those cheap goods and that took us of course to China and we gave that as an example of one factory that where people are making handbags for for Walmart and that got me thinking about you know the other end of really the same story you know we we look at the consumer in the US but we also need to look at who is making those goods on the other end of the world 
So how did you decide on this factory, this denim factory in South China, these two teenage female workers who are the main focus of this film, Jasmine and Orchid, and this, of course, factory owner? Research, research, research. <laughs> um, I went to China with a very, very thin notion of what I wanted to do, and that ignorance and naivete on my part actually ended up being very helpful because had I known in advance the kind of obstacles I would be facing, I may not have even embarked on a whole project to begin with. Um, for example, I didn't know about uh, the media control, um, how tight it is in China, uh, and what we would have to go through. Uh, I didn't expect people there to be so um, weirded out by the presence of a Westerner. Um, you, we have to remember that the people who do these kinds of jobs are peasants from rural provinces who have never had any contact with foreigners. And, uh, you know, as a documentary filmmaker, you always aim to, to blend in with, with the furniture and have people forget that you're there so that they will behave normally while you film them. And that took a very long time with these workers because they have never seen a Westerner before, let alone have one in their dorm room and talk to them. Um, so it took a long time just to get them to be, you know, relaxed and not self-conscious and not giggle and, you know, just go about their day and ignore me. Uh, so there were there were those kind of uh, problems. Now, I did not go to China with a plan to go to a jeans factory. What I knew is that I wanted to get access to a factory that manufactures the kind of things that we buy on a daily basis, uh, not anything exotic. Uh, we were offered early on access to a factory that was making uh, ceiling fans. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it will be very easy for people to just dismiss the whole problem by saying, well, I don't ever buy that thing, mm -hmm. uh, rather than realize that it's a metaphor for the whole the whole uh, story. So I knew I wanted um, that kind of a factory that none of us can say, well, you know, it doesn't concern me. Uh, and the other thing that I knew from the beginning is, you know, I'm basically a storyteller in documentaries. And so my idea was let's focus on a girl that just arrived on her first day when she's excited and naive and has no idea what to expect, uh, just like the viewer will find out together with her what's going on there. So that would, you know, give me from the very beginning a sense of some kind of trajectory that things will happen. Well, I want to ask you more about the logistics and the challenges and the obstacles, but let's give people a sense of, of what this film is about. It focuses, let's talk about Jasmine. She, uh -huh. as you say, she arrives at this denim factory in the city of Shashi in Guangdong province. Um, she leaves her home in the countryside to work there. Why does she leave home and what does she experience when she arrives at the factory? Uh, well, Jasmine is like millions of other people. If you grow up in rural China, especially if you're a girl, uh, your chances of going to high school are pretty slim. Uh, you know, the communist revolution uh, used to brag that they made education free and eradicated uh, illiteracy in China, but that's no longer the case. Uh, the peasants have to pay for the education of the kids, and when it gets to high school level, it's pretty expensive. Uh, and it's hard to justify, especially for a girl in China, uh, in that kind of a setting, uh, for the parents to go through that uh, extra expense because mostly she will she will get married and once she gets married she moves in with her in-laws. Uh, so uh, most of these girls uh, end up going to work after they complete middle school at the age of 14. Now at the age of 14 legally you can't work yet in China. The law says you must be at least 16. So there's a huge industry there of producing fake IDs. Everybody knows that those IDs are fake. Uh, the factory owner owners, of course, know that, but um, nobody really cares. So you have millions and millions of young kids, 14, 15 years old, leaving the villages and going to work. Uh, Jasmine takes that um, very naturally because all of her friends have done the same thing. Uh, she, by the way, has an older sister, and that's sort of unusual by itself because China has a very strict one-child policy, mm. especially in the countryside. But um, because boys are so much more prized than girls, uh, if your firstborn is a girl, sometimes you're able to get a dispensation for a second child. But that second child will have to pay even higher fees to get their education. Uh -huh. The family is penalized for that. So that's an extra reason why, for Jasmine, it was clear all along that she has to go to, to, to work. And in fact, one of the most 
for me, touching things that she says in a film, is that she was sure that when she was born, her parents were disappointed that she came out a girl, too. And just imagine going through life, of, you know, with that kind of a feeling. Um, but, you know, mostly I want to focus on Jasmine as representative of millions of other people who go and take these jobs because there aren't, there is no work in the countryside. The Chinese government has these, um, uh, policies that created, that developed the coastal areas of China with industry, especially for export, because those are the areas that are close to the, to the harbors, so it's quicker and cheaper to get the goods out of the country. But in the countryside where the labor force is, there's no employment. So the thing that's most dispensable in China is the labor force. Let let all these peasants leave their land and leave their homes and uh, go to where the work is rather than build factories where they live. So you have millions and millions of people who are housed in these dormitories in factory compounds. They have to, in spite of their very meager uh, pay, they have to then pay room and board for staying there. And also it's a form of control because they are very far away from their families, from their roots. Um, you know, in this film, and I've seen that also many times in China where they just, uh, the factories don't pay on time. Sometimes they delay weeks and months paying salaries. Well, if all of these girls would go home every night and tell their family that, you know, we're not getting paid, you know, the peasants will come down and burn down the factory. Mm -hmm. But when you live, you know, two day travel distance away from home, uh, and you're a migrant worker, which means that you only have a permit to stay where you are away from your province, provided that you have a job that you can be fired from at any minute, you know, you, you, you bet you're going to be pretty docile about all of that. Uh, so it's another form of, uh, of controlling the workers. Um, so when, when Jasmine arrives, she's put into um, you know, a dormitory room with 11 others. Uh, we say in the film that uh, this is actually one of the better factories around. Uh, I've seen factories with 20 people in a room and not even one toilet for the room. They'll have five stalls at the end of the corridor for everybody. But in this factory, each one of those rooms with 12 uh, people has its own uh toilet uh, and a water faucet, which you now that's the closest to the sink that, or, or shower that they have. Um, and uh, the daily routine for someone like her is that uh, you start work at 8, you have a lunch break, you have a dinner break, uh, you go back to work, and then you have your, your favorite break, which is the midnight snack. Uh, why is that your favorite? Because uh, it's free. The factory gives them like a bun at midnight, uh, and on a typical day, they would finish work around 1 or 2 o'clock. That's, that's 17, 18 hours. Yeah, uh, and uh, that's also, by the way, seven days a week during the busy season. Uh, in the textile industry, you have the busy season uh, and the slow season, uh, which has to do with, you know, our holiday periods, shopping periods, that kind of thing. Overtime pay, Mika? Um, are you kidding? <laughs> how much are they paid? Um, they're paid by the piece. And if you ask a worker how much they're, they're paid, you'll always get a very complicated answer. Because um, it's never really clear to them. Uh, the pay depends on the contract that the factory signed for that particular order. Um, but uh, when she starts work, she tells us how much she is earning a day at that point, and it, it comes to about one U.S. dollar a day. Mika. She will get better, she'll get faster, and it could come up to $2 a day. Mika Pellet is his name. He is a, a longtime director and producer of films and videos. He's founder of Teddy Bear Films. He founded that in 1999, Teddy Bear Films. Dot com. He produced and directed the acclaimed documentary Store Wars, When Walmart Comes to Town. And China Blue is the film, the documentary film we're talking about today, an expose of sweatshop labor and a revealing look at the lives of teenage workers at a blue jeans factory in South China. China Blue has been screened in around 30 countries. It's been sold to TV in at least 15 nations. 
And uh, we are delighted that Mika can join us and talk about this uh, highly acclaimed and very interesting and surprising and shocking documentary based on his extraordinary access to the workers, to the dorms, to the factory owner. We even see footage of the factory owner dealing with Western buyers of the factory's products. That's very interesting as well. Why is Jasmine's initial paycheck withheld for so long, Mika? Well, um, uh, uh, um, you know, one of the things that goes on there is that the workers don't know the terms of their employment. They don't know what the rules are. They don't know what their rights are. Uh, we've asked them many times, have you ever seen the, um, the labor laws of, of China? And they never have. And so uh, those things come as a surprise to them. So, for example, the factory has um, uh, a rule that the first salary um, is kept they call it the deposit, which the worker would only get when they terminate their employment and only if they terminate it with the uh, permission of the factory. Now, the factory just never never allows the workers to, to, uh, to quit. You see, because they're not being paid by the hour, because of being paid per piece, when there's less work uh, during the, the slow season, the workers only may work two, three days a week and barely make enough money to even cover the room and the board, but it doesn't bother the factory that they stay there, so they'll never give them their permission to leave, and when they are finally forced to leave at some point, they just forfeit that first uh, salary. Um, now, this is something that in a film you only find out along with her when, you know, because she's so delighted that finally she's getting paid, uh, only to find out that everybody else gets paid except, except her. Mr. Lamb is the owner of this denim factory. Uh, how in the world did you get his permission to come in and film? And how does he characterize his management style? <laughs> um, well, uh, you know, um, let me just first say that I feel that um, we live in a world where it's getting harder and harder to get straight information from institutions, from governments, from corporations, and that what freelance journalists and filmmakers ought to have to do is use whatever technique they can to get that information out. And I feel that the public rights to know trumps, you know, any kind of misrepresentation that I engage in with with the people who hold this information. Uh, so in this case, um, I approached Mr. Lamb telling him that um, this film is going to be about the first generation of uh, Chinese entrepreneurs that are transforming China into a free market, uh, and that we're doing the research now in a number of factories. I cannot even promise him that he will end up being in the film. Uh, but I will need complete access to his factory 24-7, uh, and that one of the important things he does is provide employment, and so we very much want to film with the people who benefit from that employment. Um, and that's how it started. Uh, now, Mr. Lamb is, of course, a product of the Chinese system where you don't see television that takes any kind of a critical independent stance vis-a-vis -vis the authorities. So I guess it just didn't even occur to him that I could be, you know, from the other side, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was very generous with his time, with opening uh, the doors to me. He told everybody in the factory to cooperate with me. And I really could not have had a better, better partner. Now, he did get something out of it, which is uh, at some point in order to continue his cooperation, I created a five-minute sales promo for his factory from the footage that I shot. Interesting. Five minutes of, you know, smiling workers and a couple of his customers praising the factory and my voice in English uh, saying, you know, we always deliver on time <laughs> uh, and gave it him on a DVD. And until today, if you go to the website of the Lee Fang Jeans factory, you could <laughs> see the, the sales promo there. I see. Um, which, you know, I consider the price I had to pay to maintain, you know, the access. Um, now, when the film came out, he did get into some trouble with the authorities. Um, the film is banned in China, but it did show in Hong Kong, and the Chinese press wrote about it. And so he got a visit from government officials. And, you know, you would think that they would come to him and say, Mr. Lamb, this film documents how you're breaking every law in the labor laws of our country. You don't pay minimum wage. You don't pay overtime. You don't give your workers one rest day a week, et cetera, et cetera. 
But no, they were not concerned with any of that. They came to him demanding explanation. Why did you cooperate with foreign media without a permit? Mika Pellet, the uh, the show is Against the Grain on Pacifica Radio, KPFA, kpfa.org. My name is C.S. Song. The associate producer, Jen Angel, is at the controls. Mika has directed and produced uh, an award-winning documentary film entitled China Blue. And we are talking about both logistics and the content uh, of this film. So this Mr. Lamb does let you in and gives you unprecedented access, incredible access to uh, the workers speaking candidly. Not just, by the way, I should tell our listeners about their... Um, their problems at work, but also about their dreams, about their individual dreams, personal aspirations, what they'd like to do. We see them uh, dancing and we see them meeting uh, their uh, boyfriends. We see them actually, one of them going back to her village with her boyfriend. Very, very interesting scene there. Um, what does Mr. Lamb say about his employees and their work ethic? Well, uh, Mr. Lamb uh, thinks of the employees like all other industrialists, which is that they're they're just cogs, they're they're tools, they're they're all dispensable. Uh, and he also thinks that they have very poor work ethics. Um, um, but um, you know what's really important um, for me is that people come out of the film realizing that Mr. Lamb himself is a cog in this machine, or I think of it as a as a food chain where everybody, you know, uh, squeezes those below him. And you mentioned before that we see him doing business. Um, that was very important for me to try to get one of those scenes where we're actually in the closed room where he's talking prices with a buyer from the West. And the buyer, who happens to be from England, uh, says, well, you know, 4.2 um, for dollars twenty cents is, is not um, good enough. I can give you $4 for that. Later on, Mr. Lamb explains to us that, that those 20 cents difference is his profit margin. You know, his profit margin is small. He operates on a big volume. And he has no choice, but he has to take the order. But in order for himself to have some kind of profit, he squeezes the workers even worse. Uh, and he's got all kind of tools to do that. He, first of all, he, he pays them a little bit less per piece. Uh, second, he can uh, tell his supervisors to find them more often. You can be fined per each minute that you're late. You can be fined if you're going to the bathroom too often, if you're giggling at work, for, for lots of things. Uh, so that's how he survives. But we really have to remember that this is a system that is created not by the Chinese factory owners, but by the multinational corporations that come from here uh, and place those demands on them. And those demands are both in terms of very, very low prices uh, and also in terms of very fast delivery dates, which is why the workers have to work around the clock practically to make those deadlines. Yeah, the factory owner really has no choice because if he refuses the work, he has no work. If, if let's say, um, somebody in China said, you know, I'm going to start a textile factory that will be right. I'm going to treat the workers at least according to the basic labor laws of my country. Someone like that would not be able to survive in the business environment today because he would have to price his goods so much higher than everybody else that he couldn't get any orders. So there's just no other way around it. So, Mika, we hear from uh, many of these multinational corporations that there is some kind of monitoring, that there is some kind of inspection regime so that people in this country can be assured that where their clothing comes from actually does offer their workers good working conditions, fair wages, and the like. And one telling segment in this film, China Blue, discusses or addresses what happens when inspectors come to look at the factory. What did you witness? Um, the inspectors, first of all, always notify weeks in advance their date of arrival. So they would never catch the factory unprepared. Second, um, the managers uh, drill the workers in how to answer questions. Questions like how many hours you work, how much money you, you make, um, do you have a cafeteria, do you have a rest day a week, all those kind of things. Uh, and the workers comply because they're told that um, if you tell the truth, we will lose the orders and you're going to be out of a job. Uh, there is a whole charade around these monitoring thing. And, you know, if we go to the websites of our favorite textile companies, 
uh, they all seem so socially conscious and so s sensitive and ethical, and uh, they all have departments that handle this kind of stuff. But the whole thing is just a charade. Um, if you bother to read, um, for example, the annual report of the Gap, they were the first that actually got ahead of the curve and admitted publicly in their annual report that over 50% of the factories with whom they deal in China, in fact 70%, did not fully comply with their own code of conduct. Mm. Um, now, then you ask yourself, well, what happens if a factory doesn't comply? You know, I thought, well, they will terminate the contract with the factory and go somewhere else. But, oh no, it takes a while to f develop a good relationship with the factory. You know, the, the concerns of the, of the retailers here are completely different. Their concerns are about quality control of the goods. You know, factories that get the, um, the size of the men or women's mixed up or don't do the pocket stitches correctly or all of that. So if you find a factory that actually does good quality and delivers on time, you don't want to terminate the relationship with them. It took a while to train them to do it your way. So what you do is you give them a slip on the, rat, on the wrist and you tell them we're coming back in six months and you better fix these three, four items, whatever they are. Now in, in China right now you have a, a, a huge growth uh, industry which is how to fool the inspectors. And you hire a consultant that, um, the, the, I read one story in, uh, about one, one of these guys, he charges $5,000 to make sure that the, the, the factory uh, passes the Walmart, in that case it was Walmart inspection. Um, and they train the factory in how to create um, double systems in their books, to have fake time cards that get punched every afternoon by security guards as if the workers terminated the day. Um, and have this very elaborate system because all of that is still cheaper than to actually comply. And the the Western um, retailers know all about that. Uh, it's just basically a system of, you know, help us be able to tell our people that you're okay. Don't let us catch you in anything. Mika Pellet is founder of Teddy Bear Films. He's producer and director of Store Wars, When Walmart Comes to Town. And he has directed and produced a film that literally has taken the world by storm. It's entitled China Blue, an award-winning documentary film. And we are delighted to have Mika, who used to direct Media Alliance, an organization many of our listeners know about, on the phone with us today to talk about China Blue. There is also this image, Mika, of workers in other countries being pliant, being docile, and perhaps even some stereotypes of Chinese people might reinforce uh, those kinds of images. And yet, when the delay in getting their paychecks becomes intolerable, the workers at this Li Feng factory in your film go en masse to the factory owner's office. And, and what do they do and what did it mean to you to include this footage? Well, first of all, I was very lucky to get that footage that we were there on the day when, when that happened. And we actually see them standing up to their bosses and demanding to get paid. Uh, what is going on there is that they haven't gotten paid in nine weeks. Nine weeks. And um, that um, we have a scene where we, we hear the, the boss tell the other managers during a management meeting that um, they're going to be short on cash because the customer hasn't sent the money in time. And they keep on talking about other things that don't consider that a big problem. It's a very common occurrence over there uh, that you, you know, if you're short on cash, then you just don't pay salaries. You don't, you know, you don't try to borrow the money somewhere or, you know, pay no matter what. So nine weeks without pay and um, the workers are, are, you know, going nuts. Um, for example, some of them, uh, we have one girl in the film, Orchid, that we see on the phone with her mom. She sends money home. Um, Many of the fa of the families back in the village depend on these monthly checks that their their children send back home. So it it reverberates all the way back to the countryside for millions of families and factories just don't pay. So what happens here is that they're a day before um, the deadline to ship the goods out, and this is the one time when they know that they have the factory over a barrel. If they do a, a work stoppage at that moment, the factory would not have time to replace them and bring in new workers. They would be late on a, on shipment, and they probably would never get another order from that particular client. And so they're able to force uh, the boss to agree to pay them right away. 
uh, and that's a very rare thing. We've heard, and uh, I saw, for example, okay, here's one technique in China, a factory that was making video games for Walmart, didn't pay salary for three months, mm. then told the fact the workers, sorry, we went bankrupt, we have no money, you all have to clear out of here and go home. Mm. The workers didn't even have the money for the bus ticket to go home. And mind you, when, when that happens, you also lose, you know, the place where you live because they're all staying in the dormitories of the factory, so they have nowhere to go. And suddenly they all find themselves on the street. Of course, the police is there, always siding with the factory owner. The police is there not to inquire, you know, which side is breaking the law or whatever. They're just there to enforce um, the, the, the sort of the, the tranquility of industrial production. They're at, at the behest of the factory owners. Uh, these things happen all the time. What kinds of problems, speaking of the Chinese authorities, did you encounter trying to get this film once shot out of China? Well, the main problem was, you see, in China you have to have a, a, a permit uh, to make a film, and we did not have one. And as long as you filmed inside the factory or around the factory, we were fine. But um, I really wanted to also film in the countryside. Now, we talked about Jasmine, the main character, but we filmed in China for a year and a half before we met Jasmine. Mm. We had a different girl who also, the same concept on her, from her first day. Her name was uh, Xiaoyu, Little Fish. And then SARS broke out, and we didn't go to China for eight months. And during that time, Little Fish uh, basically couldn't handle that work anymore. She broke down, and she went back to her village. We stayed in contact with her, and when we came back to China, we went directly to her village, uh, planning to film what I thought is going to be the, the end of the film. Um, I myself stayed an hour away from the village because from previous visits we already knew that as soon as a Westerner arrives with a camera, it attracts a lot of attention and the police is there. So I stayed away and I had my associate producer uh, with a local cameraman um, go over there. My associate producer, uh, Song Chen, is a Amer Chinese-American um, who claimed that she is a local Chinese. The police came and saw that she has a passport that not only she's American, but it says that she was born in Taiwan. Uh -oh. And they thought they caught a, you know, big spy over there in the countryside. And they arrested her and the cameraman. They interrogated them until four in the morning. Luckily, the cameraman had all kinds of contacts. And he was allowed to make phone calls. And finally, they were released. But the girl, uh, Little Fish, and her family was told that they're going to be in, in a big mess if the film comes out with her in it. So we had to throw all this year and a half of footage of her out and go back to the Li Fang factory where we thought that we were pretty much done and start all over again as the supervisors who, you know, who's starting work today and start filming again with three or four girls for a few days and then we realized Jasmine is clearly the best of them and, and bet on her. Um, and it was at that point that I made that um, sales um, DVD for the factory because, uh, you know, I knew that he could easily ask me, well, why am I still here? And so then you finish up at the factory. Yeah. Then, and by the way, the other thing that we had to do is um, we had to smuggle the camera into into China because you know it's one thing to to bring a mini DV camera than pretend that you're a tourist. But if you want to bring a professional bigger camera, you know, you're supposed to have that kind of work, uh, film permit. And so we took a camera apart three times, smuggled it across the border, and smuggled it out of China. Um, but otherwise, um, yeah, we were able to always get the footage out uh, without a problem. And um, yeah, the rest is history. <laughs> we have uh, just a few minutes left for you. I want to ask you about two things. One is uh, upcoming projects, things you're working on right now, and also just your comments about the relationship of filmmaking and activism. Well, filmmaking and activism is something that's close to my heart. Um, you know, I don't make uh, activist uh, organizing videos. I make films for the general public, but they are also very uh, useful for um, activist organizations. And we have done some wonderful things with this film, but unfortunately it has been mostly in Europe. For example, in Germany, the Clean Clothes campaign uh, organized for me a two-week tour where every night we show the film in a cinema in a different city, mm. often in, in big multiplexes. And somebody from the organization was there with me, and whenever the question came, what can we do, which 
always is there. The local person could take over and say, well, we actually have a campaign right now, and they would distribute these postcards that they ask people to take to their favorite clothing stores that says, we're not going to shop here anymore until you get a sweatshirt of free clothes um, and, you know, other things. So um, that's the kind of um, partnership that can easily happen between a film and an activist organization. And, of course, it doesn't require the filmmaker to be there in person. They can run with the film on their own. Um, I've seen here uh, in the Bay Area, uh, I've been fortunate enough to uh, go to quite a few high schools of this film as well as, as, as well as colleges and see how young people respond to the film. They feel like their eyes are opened and uh, they really want to do something about it. And of course, it's a film about people their age and it's about one of their favorite products. Um, and that's the opportunity for an activist organization to engage them. And there's so many things that one can do. Uh, research for sweatshop free clothes online, uh, maybe start uh, uh, some kind of a, co a connection with um, workers in another country. Um, uh, there are a lot of things one can do. And Micah, Amika, I'm sorry, uh, what, right. what are you doing to uh, follow up on China Blue? Well, China Blue was the second in a trilogy um, that I'm making about globalization, and I'm now researching uh, the third one, which um, I hope will be in India. And we'll look at uh, farmer suicides. We've had 30,000 farmers in India committing suicide out of despair because they can't afford uh, to pay their debts for the land anymore. A lot of it has to do with the patented seeds from Monsanto that are uh, required to buy, and every year they have to buy them again because those seeds are programmed not to regenerate. Uh, it has to do with world uh, commodity prices that are totally out of their control, and we're researching that right now. And in fact, if any of your listeners, if your listeners uh, know something about it, has those kind of contacts in India, I would love to hear from them. Uh, TeddyBearFilms.com is the way to reach us. TeddyBearFilms.com. Do you have a tentative title for that film? Um, well, uh, not yet. Okay. Mika Pellet, it's M-I-C-H-A-P-E-L-E-D with Teddy Bear Films, teddybearfilms.com. And he's uh, produced and directed many videos and films. He did videos for the U.S. peace movement back in the 1980s. We've been talking about his film, China Blue, an extraordinary expose based on unprecedented access to a Chinese denim factory thank you so much mika congratulations on the film i wish we had more time to talk uh, but uh, i appreciate the time you spent with us it's my pleasure cs and that was a conversation i had not too long ago with mika pellet the filmmaker of china blue and my name is cs song and you're listening to special kpfa fun drive programming we're in the last week of our Fall Fund Drive, trying to make our goal of $850,000. And guess what? You can help us. You can help us do that. You can help us on our way. You could give $300,000 right now, or you could do what's more likely, much more likely, which is to pledge $100 and get as your very own the film, China Blue on DVD. A $100 pledge to KPFA gets you the film China Blue on DVD, 510-848-5732, 510-848-KPFA, or toll-free 1-800-439-KPFA. You can also pledge securely online at kpfa.org and get your choice of many different thank you gifts. This film, China Blue is in Chinese, the vast majority of it, with English subtitles. And that's why I chose to interview Mika, who, as you can tell, is a wonderful speaker and spokesperson and conversation partner. He was telling us, of course, about not only the content of China Blue, but the insane effort that he it took to film this film, which required... Uh, you know, obviously it's very difficult to get into a Chinese factory, to get the workers to talk with you candidly, to get the owner to talk with you candidly, to film what's going on inside the factory that produces so many blue jeans that you and I might be wearing right now. 
510 I found this film utterly eye-opening. It shows the nightmare of globalization in a way that abstract commentary, general commentary, simply cannot. And I could spend easily the rest of this hour and the next just reading the words of critical praise that this film has earned. Praise from journalists, critics, newspapers, magazines, film festivals, human rights groups. But I won't. I'll just simply, well, actually, I will share some of that. But I will ask you to call 1-800-439-5732 or 510-848-5732 and get your very own copy of this eye-opening film, China Blue by Mika Pellid. The film humanizes a problem often described in, in general terms. You have the real-life people of Jasmine, a thread cutter, an orchid, a zipper installer in this Li Feng factory in the city of Shaxi in Guangdong province. And it reveals, this film does the human cost of making and buying apparel from sweatshops. Not just making, but also buying apparel from sweatshops like this denim factory. Here are the peasants that big business advocates claim are uplifted by globalization. You can see for yourself how they're treated, if they're paid. I was going to say how they're paid, if they're paid often, and how they live. 510-848-5732. 1-800-439-5732. The film has appeared in the Bay Area. It has played to sold-out audiences and theaters around this area and, of course, many other locations here and around the world. If you want your front-row seat to this film and this film that you can uh, broadcast, that you can play whenever you like in your home or in the homes of families or friends or activists or concerned people in your community, or to use as a gift, a holiday gift, maybe in the upcoming holiday gift season, 510-848-5732, 1-800-439-5732. The SF Chronicle said the most heartbreaking moving film in theaters right now, this is a little while back, is not Babel, Letters from Iwo Jima, or Little Children. It is China Blue. This is an unforgettable film. New York Magazine, this is one of the best of many recent documentaries about globalization. Mika Pellid's marvelous documentary about the young women who work in a Chinese jeans factory is an empathetic and revealing study with probing access and a level of detail similar films have failed to obtain. The film doesn't just describe the tough working conditions of these factories. It draws vigorous, charming portraits of the ma- women who work there. And the Marin Pacific Sun said a riveting documentary, a heart-wrenching story of the exploitation of young optimism and energy by the desire for profit. 510-848-5732. If you want your very own copy of this film on DVD, that's a $100 pledge to KPFA. And boy, do we need it because we are behind in this fund drive. We're trying to make $850,000 before this fund drive ends. And we may not do it. And that, of course, would have financial repercussions on this station and many of the people here. And what I'm asking you to do is to help in your own modest way, help in your own humble way, help in a way that you can afford, help us get to our goal of $850,000. And the way we do that, which is kind of miraculous, and we do it four times a year, and we've been doing for, let's see, almost 60 years now, is to ask people, individuals, not corporations, not big business, not corporate foundations, but asking you, the individual listener, to subscribe to make sure that this oldest of listener-sponsored stations in this nation and possibly around the world continues to survive. 510-848-5732-1-800-439-5732. If you do not want China Blue, which... I suggest you will enjoy and learn from. There's also on offer a KPFA sustainer pack, seven CDs for a $120 pledge to KPFA. You can get speeches by Tarek Ali, Molly Ivins, the late Molly Ivins, Howard Zinn, Tim Wise, Michael Eric Dyson, Greg Palliston, Juan Gray Mathai. You can get 
these talks, these extended talks by some of the best people on the left, some of the most incisive commentators on the left for a $120 one-year pledge to KPFA, 510-848-5732, 1-800-439-5732. Gerald Peary in the Boston Phoenix says of the film China Blue, it's a heartbreaking, truly unforgettable cinema verite stay with two teenage girls employed in a Chinese blue jean factory. It's even worse than the news stories, the exploitation, degradation, and downright slavery of millions of Chinese peasants who have traveled to the cities looking for work. There's a lot of interest in China right now with the Olympics coming up next year, with the environmental problems in China, and just with this notion of uh, what China is, how uh, huge it is, uh, what kind of relationship it will have to the United States and to the rest of the world. And this is a very rare and revealing investigation, as I said, with unprecedented access into a jeans factory in China. And if you are concerned about the products you buy, if you're concerned about sweatshops, if you are concerned about globalization, corporate globalization, if you are concerned about what people are enduring around the world to make sure we are comfortable with our consumer products at cheap prices, get this film. Educate yourself, learn from it, perhaps be inspired by these two teenage girls who have a lot to say and a lot to tell you about themselves and their lives and their work. 510-848-5732-1-800-439-5732. Mika Pellet's documentary is shockingly thorough and highly provoking. It may be close to impossible to mandate responsible capitalism, but China Blue shows us exactly what's at stake, says a critic in The Stranger about the film China Blue, yours for a $100 one-year pledge to KPFA, or you can get for a $120 pledge, the KPFA Sustainer Pack, which will occupy you for hours and hours, seven CDs of some of the very best on the progressive and radical left, Tarek Ali, Molly Ivins, Greg Pallast, Tim Wise, Wangri Matai, Howard Zinn, Michael Eric Dyson, people you appreciate hearing from. And if you appreciated hearing from Mika Pellet today, and you, like me, thought, how in the world did this man and his film crew get into the places they were able to get in China and be able to get the information they were able to get in such a candid, honest way? Because, you know, when uh, filmmakers show up, when journalists show up, of course, there's a show that's put on, right? And even Mika Pellet's film reveals this about the inspectors that show up at the factory. The factory knows the inspectors are coming, can prepare for the inspectors, and can get people to say to the inspectors or the um, U.S. visitors what the visitors or inspectors want to hear. In this case, Pellet, for some Way, in some way, for some reason, was able to get access and really get these people to open up and talk frankly. The conversations with the Chinese denim factory owner are very revealing, and it shows that the picture is very nuanced. It's quite complex. It's not just that this man is not that this man is just the bad guy and everybody else is good. He, the factory owner, is operating under certain pressures from brokers and dealers and representatives of multinational corporations. So he has limitations he's forced to work under as well. I'm not condoning what he apparently is doing to the workers in this film, but it's very interesting to find out more about the picture of sweatshop labor abroad. 510-848-5732, 1-800-439-5732. I have 10 minutes left in this special KPFA fun drive programming, I have 10 minutes left to see if the listeners out there can match $500 given by anonymous donors in Sausalito and Palo Alto. And they are essentially challenging you, the listener. No, not the listener down the street or in the car next to you or in the garden across your city, but you, the listener, to come up with $500 in any increment, and they will match any pledge that you make up to a total of $500. This is a pledge that goes into effect 
Right now, we have nine minutes to make it. Every dollar you give is doubled if you want to pledge a hundred dollars and get China Blue, the film on DVD, a marvelous uh, uh, holiday gift, by the way. When you think about the holiday gift season coming up, uh, why don't you give a gift that really will make people think about gifts, make people think about what they're buying and what they're purchasing and why the prices are so low and what workers around the world are doing and what China is like and who lives there and who gets recruited into these factories and why they are held there and how they are held there and what they get paid and when they get paid and who uh, directs them and manages them and how and what they're allowed to do in their factory. And it all results in a product that is often, in this case, mailed to the U.S. and put on store shelves and the store owners and the advertisers say, well, we have these great products for you at such um, such ridiculously low prices. 510-848-5732, 1-800-439-5732. Eye-opening, infuriating, and heartbreaking, says one critic. China Blue asks us to look hard Without the intercession of cheery marketing and attractive prices, these are the exploited children behind the clothes we buy, wear, and discard so cavalierly. 510-848-5732-1-800-439-5732. The New York Times said it best when it said, China Blue is more than an exercise in cinematic activism because it is a form of cinematic activism. The film develops a natural, dramatic structure that's profoundly affecting mr pellet doesn't just record the girls indignities he listens to their dreams china blue examines the plight of the world's largest pool of cheap labor and traces its exploitation to a retail outlet and new near you 1-800-439-5732 100 dollar pledge to kpfa gets you your very own copy of china blue and if you agree that, um, like, let's take the theater, for example, and let's say you go see a play and the play is very didactic and it just tells you stuff. And so the characters are essentially delivering the playwright's political message. And if you compare that to a play in which there are characters that you find genuinely interesting and they play out a story and in the process, a political message comes through. And if you prefer the latter to the former, the, 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 the former kind of didactic way of preaching, then you will appreciate this film, China Blue, because this film is all about the lives, the real lives and dreams and hopes and aspirations and realities and work and travel of people in China, of some very interesting people in China. And in the process of showing these stories, of telling these stories, a political message comes through. And that political message is far stronger because it's not framed didactically. It's not imposed upon you. It's not spelled out line for line in a way that makes some people kind of roll their eyes and say, okay, okay, enough already. 510-848-5732, 1-800-439-5732. Every dollar you give now is doubled. 510-848-5732. Join Joe Simpson of San Anselmo. Thank you, Joe, for subscribing to KPFA. Join Ann Jackson. Thank you very much. Join Britta. Thank you from Richmond, Richmond, California, I believe. Thank you very much. Sean Harrell of Sebastopol. Uh, thank you very much. Gene Ryder from Fresno. It's nice to hear from Fresno and people who call from the Fresno area. Their pledge goes at least in part or maybe all to KFCF in Fresno. Thank you. Kathy Wosica of Fresno. Thank you. Another Fresnoian, although I, I know I'm not using that term properly. Amy Ninful of East Palo Alto. Thank you very much, Amy. Alice Richards of Menlo Park. A lot of people calling in to get a China Blue. Brad Mamet or Mormet of Redwood City, possibly. Thank you very much. Deborah Gudger of Oakhurst. Thank you very much, Deborah. Nice to hear from Oakhurst. Jerry Bernhardt of 
Boys Hut Spring in California. I can't recall the last time I read a pledge card from Boys Hut Spring. Thank you very much, uh, Jerry. Elena Dorabchi of Cupertino. Uh, she's a professor at San Jose State. Thank you very much, Elena. All these people and many more are calling, and there's a good reason they're calling, because China Blue is a wonderful tool, a wonderful teaching tool, and a wonderful um, I, I want to say entertainment because it is a form of it. It is a, it is a story of people and it's very affecting and very moving. And, uh, you may find yourself, uh, not only being educated, but emotionally stirred by China Blue, the film by Mika Pellet, 510-848-5732-1800-438-5732. We've got three minutes left, three minutes left for me to ask you to go to your phone and call 510-848-5732 to get your very own copy on DVD of this film, China Blue. You can pledge securely online at kpfa.org. You can go to our, uh, go to the phone and call the 800 number, toll free 1-800-439-5732. You can pledge $120 and you can fill your mind and your spirit with some of the most amazing voices in progressive and radical politics today. Tarek Ali, Tim Wise, Greg Palast, Michael Eric Dyson, the late Molly Ivins, Howard Zinn, Wangari Mathai. These are all yours for $120. Seven CDs for $120 one-year pledge to KPFA. Two minutes left. We've had a number of callers. We're not going to make it to $850,000 without your support. So please, Please think about committing yourself, committing yourself to take action, to take action like thousands, perhaps millions of KPFA subscribers have done over the past six decades to join them to perhaps take responsibility. That might be one way of framing it. Take responsibility for alternative media, independent media, for keeping alternative media going, for keeping it strong and healthy for making us able to pay our electric bills, our transmitter costs, our shipping and postage, our salaries, our technical maintenance, our building maintenance, our building renovation costs, our equipment upgrades, our coverage of national breaking news. All of this requires money, and we're not asking all of it from all of you right now. We're asking some of you to call or to pledge securely online at kpfa.org and get a couple of amazing thank you gifts. $100 pledge gets you China Blue, the film on DVD. 510-848-5732. 1-800-439-KPFA. 1-800-439-5732. This is a transaction, if you'd like to call it, that will take just a few minutes. You'll talk to someone who's very friendly. They'll take down all your information. You can join Wendy Taylor of Sebastopol. Thank you, Wendy. Terry Shigio, I believe, of Fresno. Another Fresno caller. Thank you. Eileen Jong or Jang of Bodega, California. Thank you. James O'Hara of Forestville. Wow, Forestville. Maybe there are other people in Forestville listening and being inspired by the information about this film, China Blue, 510-848-5732. I have to say goodbye. My name is CS. I thank everyone who's called. We have made the match. I very, very much appreciate it. It's almost coming up 8 o'clock for Bunny and Dirch right after this message. Stay tuned. The 11th annual Mario Savio Lecture will be the great Angela Davis discussing From Jim Crow to Guantanamo, Prisons, Democracy, and Empire. Thursday, November 1st in Pauley Ballroom in the Student Union Building on the UC Berkeley campus. Admission is free. Full info is online at savio.org. That's S A B I O dot O R G.
KPFA or KPFB in Berkeley or KFCF in Fresno. Don't go nowhere. If I ventured in the slipstream 